Good evening, one and all. I'm Sylvia Earle, here with a big blue salute to all of you who've come together during the Explorers Club World Ocean Week to celebrate the ocean, to look at the problems that we now face about the decline of the ocean, but also to look at solutions about how we can go to a time of recovery and ultimately to making peace with the ocean, peace with nature, and maybe peace among ourselves. A tribute to, to the founding sponsor for Explorers Club World Ocean Week, Rolex, champions for the ocean, investing in people who are making a difference for the planet, for decades doing what it takes to really help get from where we are to a better place. Tonight, we are going to be considering an ocean-minded country, Portugal, and a group of Portuguese islands, the Azores, a place in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. People think of as islands, but the creatures in the sea, whales, turtles, hosts of others, either think of as their mountainous home under the, under the surface of the ocean, or a destination swept along by currents coming to the Azores as a safe haven huh, in the Sargasso Sea, out in the, in the high seas. So this is a place, the Azores, this treasured group of islands that are recognized by the National Geographic's pristine seas expeditions as a special destination. It is, <clears throat> it's a Mission Blue hope spot, and it's a place that will soon be recognized with enhanced protection by Portugal, by the government, by the people of Portugal, as a place that will receive special recognition and provide hope for life in the sea and for people everywhere with enhanced protection for this very special part of the planet. I personally look forward to being there in the Azores and in Lisbon to help celebrate this moment of enhanced care and to attending GLEX 2021. Hope I'll see some of you there. But right now I want to welcome the president of the Explorers Club, who will open this wonderful evening of honoring the wild blue under, <laughs> Richard Garriott. Richard, take it away. Hello again, everyone. It has been an incredible week here at the Explorers Club. I hope you have all been able to watch the energizing programs we've had over this last week. If you've missed any, they will be aired again this weekend and available on our Facebook and YouTube sites. Tonight, it is our pleasure to introduce you to our friends and partners in Portugal to kick off GLEX 2021, the Global Exploration Summit, which will be held from July 6th through 10th in both Lisbon and in the Azores. You are all invited to join us over there or stream it live if that's what you need to do. Uh, let me tell you, it was wonderful being over there recently. The people were incredibly warm and inviting, and I happen to be a huge fan of the local cuisine. Uh, the landscape and beauty, of course, out there in the Azores is world class and, and you know, truly unmatched. You know, tonight we have a very special lineup which will connect us to the pristine seas of the Azores and Portugal. The Explorers Club has been working alongside the Oceana Azul Foundation to explore and protect the deep oceans. They have, instated, they have insta uh, initiated three pillars that will promote knowledge, preservation, and sustainable use of the oceans. And here from Oceana Azul is Emmanuel Gonzalez. Emmanuel is a marine ecologist, uh, member of the Oceana Azul Foundation's Board of Directors and its Chief Scientist. He's an Associate Professor at ISPA, the Instituto Universitario, uh, and a researcher at MARE, the Marine and Environmental Sciences Center. 
He works on marine conservation and in particular, the creation, monitoring and implementation of marine protected areas. He was deputy head of the task force for marine affairs, which developed the Portuguese National Ocean Strategy, is a member of the National Council on Environmental uh, on Environment and Sustained uh, Sustainable Development. It is all yours, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Richard, for this wonderful introduction. The Oceano Zoo Foundation is very honored to be part of this year's The Explorers Club Oceans Week. Uh, Portugal has broken frontiers of exploration uh, and science throughout history, and it is very inspiring that the Explorers Club Global Exploration Summit, GLEX, will be again in Portugal in July. In this session, we will hear how the goal of protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030 is being planned, and also its significance by Enric Sala, explorer in residence at National Geographic and leader of the Pristine Seas project. We will then learn about how National Geographic Pristine Seas is working towards the goal of protecting the last wild places in the ocean by Paul Rose, expedition leader of National Geographic. Alan Friedlander, chief scientist of National Geographic Pristine Seas, will talk about the scientific assessments done in Portugal, both at Salvagens Islands in Madeira and in the Azores, in a collaboration between Pristine Seas, the Oceano Azul Foundation, the Weight Institute and the Azorean government, also with involving Azorean scientists of Oceanos and Imar. We will do a deep dive at some of the latest scientific discoveries in the largest mountain chain on the planet, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, by Telmo Morato, a senior scientist of Oceanos and Imar of the University of the Azores. And finally, we'll also learn how the Oceano Zoo Foundation is working to value the ocean's resources for the new sustainable blue bioeconomy by Ana Brazão, a project manager of the Oceano Zoo Foundation for Blue Natural Capital and the Blue Economy. So stay tuned to hear all these from scientists, explorers and leaders on our way to GLEX 2021, starting with Enric Sala, leader of the Pristine Seas Project and author of the recent groundbreaking book, The Nature of Nature, Why We Need the Wild. Today, only 7% of the ocean is in marine protected areas but we need much more. Why do we have only 7%? Mostly because there is a conflict with fishing. The fishing industry is telling us we cannot protect more because we need to catch more. But fisheries have been declining globally since the mid 90s. And today, 82% of the fish stocks are overfished. So what are we going to do? We are going to dispel this myth using data. Now we have global data on biodiversity, on fisheries, and on carbon stocks that tell us that if we protect at least 30% of the ocean, the right 30%, we will obtain multiple benefits. One, biodiversity benefits. We would protect unique and irreplaceable marine biodiversity and all the ecosystem services that it provides, including food. That's the second benefit. We know that if areas are fully protected from fishing and well managed, there will be spillover of fish that it's going to help to replenish the areas around. So if we protect the right 30% of the ocean, the global fishing catch will actually increase. And three, we have a climate change mitigation benefit. The sediments on the seafloor contain twice the amount of carbon that we can find on the soils of the land. And activities like bottom trolling and eventually deep sea mining disturb huge amounts of this sediment that contain a lot of carbon thus producing carbon emissions because some of that carbon is going to remineralize to carbon dioxide. So this is where new data, availability of data at the global scale is going to help us design a network of marine reserves covering 30% of the planet for the benefit of people and nature.
Hello everybody, Paul Rose here. I'm the expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas and it's great to be with you all at the Explorers Club Ocean Week. I only wish we really were all together in that great building in New York or even here in Geneva, Switzerland, which is a long way from the sea and it certainly feels like it at the moment. With all the stresses that the ocean has, you know, climate change, extraction of fish and mining, and the inputs that we do on pollution, we have to choose something that works. And our approach is action, and it's based on finding, exploring, and helping to protect the last truly wild, pristine places in the ocean. Um, we've had 31 expeditions. We've uh, created, helped to create with our partners, 23 marine protected areas, totaling over 6 million square kilometers. This is our approach. Um, as you can imagine, in the shallow water, we're scuba diving using baited cameras and open water cameras. I mean, shallow down to about 50 meters. From 50 to 100 meters, we rebreathers, mixed gas rebreathers. Um, down to 400 meters, we use our manned submarine on the Argo. And at full ocean depth, and we've been there with the drop camera all the way to the Mariana Trench and back up, we use our drop cameras, which are baited underwater video cameras. And here's a short film of what an expedition with pristine seas with us really looks like. What we do is hunt out the last pristine places in the ocean and protect them. What we're adding to this that hasn't been done before here or elsewhere is trying to understand the entire ecosystem and how all that is connected. Cada sitio tiene su su historia particular. Entonces lo que mi trabajo lo lo que intento es sacar imágenes que cuenten esa historia, ¿no? Come las labores. We came here to explore an area that has been proposed for protection, and now. I'm more sure than ever that this place has to be protected. We have so much more ocean protected now than when we started Pristine Seas 12 years ago. Our expedition planning is looks exactly what you would imagine, I suppose. Loads of National Geographic maps, key members of the team, whiteboards and lots of stickies to work out where we're going to go. And we work out two columns. One is the scientific case made for each target area, bearing in mind we're doing three or four expeditions a year. And the other is the political opportunity. And we match all these things up so that we can then work out where to go. So in the short term, say one or two years, we have them scoped out perfectly. Uh, for the next five years or 10 years, they're a little more sketchy, but we've got them planned in. Um, and in fact, we do. We've got another 40 expeditions to deliver in the next 10 years. But we've now got a third column that we're running, which is post-COVID recovery. So it's been quite the job to get everything back on stream. And I'm sure you've all had the same kinds of challenges, but eventually we have these kinds of meetings and then it's a wonderful job to go and get our ship. When we first started, I thought, well, maybe we'll sort of do the Cousteau job and we'll have our own version of Calypso and travel the world, but it doesn't work for us practically. 
because we're trying to be in certain places at key times. And so that means that we just can't get there. We just can't get to the places. So we charter ships. I must say this was a highlight of mine, chartering the James Clark Ross. I was the base commander for the British Antarctic Survey for 10 years. And the James Clark Ross was new then. Uh, and I sailed on her many, many times. And it was wonderful to go back into British Antarctic Survey headquarters and be on the other side of the table and organize the charter. And this was actually chartered for our expedition to Ascension Islands. This is the Argo. And it is one of the smallest vessels we ever worked from, but she's been designed for diving. So really she is our favorite vessel. Everywhere on it is perfect for scuba diving. And she's the home for the little yellow submarine. You see at the bottom there, the Argo, which is a brilliant tool for us to operate down to 400 meters. Um, and as you know, as well as I do, or more than likely better than I do, there are lots of ways of measuring pristineness. What is a pristine part of the ocean? Well, aside from the scientific thinking, I have one method, and that is I try and get in with Alan Friedlander, who's our chief scientist, on the first dive of the region. And as it's an exciting moment, isn't it? Often we're in places where nobody has ever dived. At the very least, it's a place where it's rarely dived. So it's very exciting to roll back in off the boat and make that first dive. And I love to make that first dive and look at Alan. And I can tell by his body position and a look in his eyes what he thinks of the place. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful just to see that. And he's excited. And guess what? We're in an amazing, pristine area. We swim and in the shallow water, we're doing surveys of all kinds, but we can only spend so long in the water. So we do use these remote cameras. These are a great investment. These are the Pelagic cameras, which is a partnership with University of Western Australia, Perth. And these Pelagic cameras float at about 20 meters. They're baited. Uh, we deploy them two or three times a day and we get some fantastic results from this. It's a really amazing tool. Down at full depth, we use the drop cameras. We've got versions of these. These are the big ones. And we've got ones that are a bit smaller. Typically, we have two or four on each expedition and deploy them twice a day. And depending on the depth and the scientific analysis, we can have them down for a few hours or all day if necessary. Using the submarine is a real treat. There's a picture of me in it uh, reporting from about 300 meters. And it means that we can go in the scientists can have good long dives, say three hour, three and a half hour dives. But it's a smart design because the pilot is in the back. You can just about see Schmulik in the back there. And the two scientists can be in the front so they can do their, do their surveys. It's a really, really brilliant tool. Um, it's especially good when we can take influencers, when we can take countries' ministers down in the sea. And maybe it's the first time, maybe they're not divers, but it's certainly the first time they've been that deep. And it's often the first opportunity they've had to understand their bit of the ocean, fall in love with it. And, you know, you can't protect anything unless you understand it and fall in love with it. So this is a wonderful thing that we do. One of the best investments we have is with our young explorers. You know, we call them these classroom explorer sessions. And on every expedition we go, near the start and near the end, we run these classroom explorer sessions. They're absolutely great. I mean, here's what it looks like at the other end. This is actually Emmanuel and Jen Cassell on our vessel in the Azores. And it turns out that it can use a bit of bandwidth. So we generally put duct tape on my iPhone and, and stick it to the tripod. And because of the cleverness of the system run by a genius called Joe Grabowski, we communicate with hundreds of schools and therefore thousands of young ones. It's an absolutely brilliant thing to do. 45 minutes near the start of the expedition, 45 minutes near the end. So it's a dream really, isn't it? Because in the older scientific expedition days, which I know so well, you would be frustrated not being able to get out key messages. But now we do it instantly. And I absolutely love to do it. As I say, that's Emmanuel and uh, Jan Cassell there uh, in the Azores. And this was our great ship, the Santa Maria Manuela. What a wonderful thing. I mean, it was an old cod fishing vessel in Portuguese water. So it was brilliant to be on that expedition, lead it with Emmanuel. And it felt very much as a Portuguese community vessel. And uh, there we were in the Azores on the Santa Maria Manuela. Life on board her was, as you might imagine, a diving expedition vessel to be. Lots of business, loads of people going diving all the time, lots of small boats, 
all the usual amount of gear. You can see on the left, it's one of our smallest recompression chambers, one man hyperlight, which worked great. On the right hand side, all the usual material. So the buzz on board that vessel was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful expedition. We were sailing in company with the Portuguese Navy vessel, the Almiranto Gago Cortino. And she was the opposite of uh, Santa Maria Manuela. In the fact, she's, she's very modern. She was highly technical and was the home to this great ROV. And this really did break down the barriers. It was a real game changer for us. It meant that we could produce these kinds of things, swath bathymetry and their work and their great surveys helped discover one of the main expedition successes, which was a new hydrothermal vent. There's a picture of it on the bottom right down there. And this was a really brilliant discovery, groundbreaking. Um, life on board when we run these expeditions is focuses around whiteboards. We can't go anywhere without whiteboards. You can imagine we develop a big plan and that's the way it is, but then every day it needs to be fine tuned to weather conditions and uh, changes in priorities. So my life is always revolving around these two great men. There's Emmanuel Gonzalez there, um, and there is uh, Alan Friedlander, our chief scientist. So my job is to work with both of these people and everybody else and just make everything happen each day. We were lucky in the Azores because we, let's face it, a lot of the time, because we're working in pristine regions, we're working away from people. Sometimes we work in regions of the ocean where there's no communities at all. But in the Azores, as you well know, there is a brilliant community. So for instance, in Corvo, which is home to a tiny community-led uh, marine protected area, we could go into the school, meet the young ones, do presentations. And this was a brilliant thing. I was very excited about this one because when we speak about marine protected areas, we speak about big ones. It's the big ones that are the most effective. But there's a, it was a wonderful thing for us to dive and be with the people that organize this very, very tiny marine protected area and see how successful it is. It's a great common denominator for getting the message out of the value of marine protected areas. And of course, we use some of our clever swath tools to even map. This was a new idea for us that we could map where we had made our scientific surveys. This was a really useful tool, um, even though we used it a lot of the time, we use this one just on the, on the tiny Corvo Island. We also do our best to get young ones onto the ship. And here we are back on the Santa Maria Manuela. Young ones coming on, it's great. They can work with us and see what we're up to. And the, as, as you know, often the questions from the young ones are often the most complex. The Azores was a great expedition. We, it was in two parts, really, 2016, 2018. And the, just that list of numbers. And I always look at the number of dives. You know, in a few weeks, we had 600 dives, 500 hours underwater. 21,000 square kilometers, kilometers of newly mapped seafloor, 60 hours of the deep sea ecosystems ROV. I mean, this, every time we get to the end of the expedition and we pull up these statistics, I get very, very excited. When we worked in the Salvagens, I was lucky enough to be working there with Emmanuel Gonzalez and it was our first time working together. We fell in love with a wave. And you would think that for a professional team who spend their lives at sea, how could you possibly fall in love with a wave? Well, this was a wave over a shallow seamount just off of Salvagens, actually between the large and the small island. We worked around it a lot. We saw it was very attractive. It was very complicated to work around. As a, you know, our dive boat, our small uh, tender dive boats get flooded quite quickly with these kinds of waves, but irresistible to jump in and dive there creates lots of upwellings. And here's what it felt like underwater. The self is a very vibrant place. And it wasn't long ago that Jacques Cousteau called it the clearest water in the world. And we really enjoyed our expedition there. It was a, a brilliant trip. We were on a small boat called the Plan B. So there was only 11 of us. And uh, normally we try and be about 16 or 18 people. But we absolutely loved the Selvagens. The, the life was absolutely terrific. Um, we had great results from the drop camera. Um, this is a small tooth 
um, uh, sand tiger shark at 1,000 meters. And we particularly were taken by the Corrie's shearwater, shearwaters, these iconic birds. Um, and it's partly because of these birds that the Selvagens were first protected. Um, we, we discovered life with these birds was wonderful. Inevitably, they came on board our vessel at night, so we had to have all the lights off. But we still found a few in the morning and had to sort of look, get them airborne again as soon as we could. But we did fall in love with that wave. We loved it a lot. We also fell in love with this guy. This is Salvagens the dog. And um, he was just beautiful to us. And we all ended up focusing on Salvagens the dog. And in fact, um, I went back to Portugal the year after this expedition to receive an award from uh, PWC. And uh, we even had some music dedicated to the great dog. Um, so we're happy to be going back to sea. It's been a year and a bit of no um, action, but we have been pleasantly surprised with how much we can get done remotely. I don't know about you, but it's been quite the revelation as to how much you can achieve without actually traveling everywhere, particularly us with National Geographic Education and Ocean Matters. It's been good. But now, thank heavens, we are going back to sea. We're going to the Southern Lion Islands, Kiribati, um, for the month of October. It's an important mission because Enric was last there 10 years ago, so we can do great comparative studies. And um, I guess I don't need to tell you that we just can't wait to get back to sea again. So thank you very much. It's been great to join you for my little bit of the Explorers Club Ocean Week and hope to see you soon, either at the club here in Switzerland or maybe who knows, on a dive somewhere. Thank you very much. A mil quilómetros de distância da Europa fica um remoto posto avançado português no Atlântico Norte. As Ilhas Selvagens. Um ambiente duro e agreste. Repleto de naufrágios. Uau, não há lugar para esconder. Sob estas vagas violentas fica um outro mundo. Um ecossistema único de importância vital para o Oceano Atlântico. Mas para o ver, terão de enfrentar este mar agitado. Em setembro de 2015, a National Geographic Pristine Seas, a Fundação Wade e a Fundação Oceano Azul realizaram uma expedição a um dos territórios mais remotos de Portugal, as Ilhas Selvagens. Os resultados científicos desta expedição inédita são surpreendentes. Três vezes mais biomassa de peixes costeiros nas selvagens do que na Ilha da Madeira. Dez vezes mais biomassa de predadores de topo, como por exemplo, garopas. Realizaram 150 horas de mergulho científico e descobriram a zona entre marés mais intacta da região. No mar aberto e em zonas profundas, encontraram também um conjunto incrível de espécies. Os resultados desta expedição provam que as selvagens apresentam o ecossistema marinho mais bem preservado do Atlântico Norte. No entanto, a reduzida dimensão da reserva torna este ecossistema altamente vulnerável à pesca e às alterações climáticas, aumentando a sua fragilidade. Assim, torna-se fundamental a expandir a reserva marinha das selvagens. Hello and happy Ocean Week. I'm Alan Friedlander, Chief Scientist for National Geographic, Pristine Seas, and a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii. Today, I'd like to talk to you about our work in saving the last wild places in the ocean with a focus on Portugal's island archipelagos. 
Our pristine seas project with National Geographic aims to save the last wild places in the ocean. And we do this through a combination of science, exploration, media, and policy. Over the past 12 years, we've had over 30 expeditions from pole to pole and everywhere in between. And we've, these have led to the creation of 23 large protected areas, protecting over 6 million square kilometers of some of the last wild places in the ocean. These last wild places give us a window into what the oceans look like before there was extensive human exploitation. And they can help us better understand how to manage places where we have people today. They're also incredibly inspiring because they show us what ecosystems looked like in the past, but also what healthy oceans would look like in the future if we had better protection around more areas of the ocean. And what we've learned over the last 12 years visiting these places in the, in the last wild places is that they're dominated by large predators, species like sharks and other large animals, which have been eliminated from many places around the world, yet are not only abundant but dominant in these remote last wild places. And that's what ecosystems all look like in the past. They're also dominated and have iconic species like whales and polar bears and species that are charismatic and emblematic of, of what you think of as natural. They also contain a lot of endemic species, species found nowhere else on earth, like this striped butterfly fish here from the Juan Fernandez Islands off of Chile. These species are irreplaceable because they're found nowhere else, and hence these places harbor extremely highly important biodiversity. These last wild places also have complex habitats, like these kelp forests seen here, or, or coral reefs. They create the three-dimensional structure that, that creates all the biodiversity that's important for these healthy ecosystems. They also harbor species that make this ecosystem intact. When all the pieces of the puzzle are in place, all the components of the ecosystem are there, the entire ecosystem is more resilient and more resistant to climate change and other types of disturbance events like storms and hurricanes and, and things like coral bleaching. One of the most surprising places we visited were the Salvagin Islands between Madeira and the Canaries. They're some of the few uninhabited islands in this region and they provide an interesting contrast between heavily populated Madeira, the Canaries, and other areas in the region and show us what this part of the world looked like before there was extensive human exploitation. The Salvagens is part of the Madeira Nature Reserve, and it's one of the oldest nature reserves in Portugal. We know a little bit about the terrestrial environment around Salvagens, but prior to our expedition, there was very little known about the underwater marine habitats associated with this remote uninhabited archipelago. It's the world's largest breeding area for quarry shearwaters, also important for bulwar shearwaters and the Madeira storm petrel and numerous other seabird species. And because of the importance of these seabirds, this, the salvagens for these seabird species, it was declared a special protected area under the European Union's bird directive. The salvagens are also an important migratory route for a number of open water species such as tunas, billfish, and marine mammals such as spotted dolphins, and also species like this little known bride's whale seen here. The intertidal area around Salvagens is nearly pristine with large limpets and other species that aren't found anywhere else in the region. The large sun limpet here seen in the lower left-hand corner has been virtually eliminated from many places around the region, it's highly desirable and prized as a food species. And due to the accessibility of the species and the ease of harvest, it's almost extinct in many places, except around Salvagens, where it was highly abundant and exceedingly large. Another species that's thriving in the Salvagens is the dusky grouper. The species can live for an excess of 40 years. Um, it's highly prized food fish, but is virtually eliminated in many parts of, the, of this region, over, heavily overexploited throughout the Mediterranean and the Eastern Atlantic. Uh, it's considered vulnerable by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature 
Yet it was observed on nearly every dive around Salvagens, which highlights how effective the protection of this area has been for this particular species and other species as well. An important keystone species in the Salvagens is the gray triggerfish. Uh, the species feeds on sea urchins with their powerful teeth, and elsewhere in the region, they've been overfished, which leads to a proliferation of sea urchins, which in turn graze down the macroalgae, which are important for creating the structure and habitat for a lot of the biodiversity in the region. They create what's called sea urchin barrens, which as the name implied, the places are barren and almost devoid of life. In contrast, what we see around Salvagens is these dense algal beds, these forests that are created, which form uh, uh, complex habitats and a number and high diversity of species like this painted wrasse, which we see here. Prior to our expedition, little was known about the deep sea environment around El Salvagens. Uh, we found a diverse community going down to several hundred meters where we saw black coral and a num number of other long-lived important species. And then in the deeper depths, we even found this um, one small tooth sand tiger shark at a thousand meters. So because we were able to examine from the intertidal down to several thousand meters, we were able to paint a picture of what an intact un entire ecosystem looked like in the absence of human exploitation. And tells us what ecosystems can look like elsewhere if we can serve the entire ecosystem from near shore down to the deepest depths. So going from the largest animals to the smallest animals, we also found a diverse assemblage of foraminifera. These primitive single-celled organisms can tell us a lot about environmental conditions and also about biogeography within the region. We identified 62 unique species of foraminifera during the expedition. Um, they're stunningly beautiful little creatures. Uh, some of these are scanning electron microscope. Uh, images of, of these foraminifera, they're, they're quite small. But we found interesting affinities with species here and also with Bermuda and parts of the Caribbean. And this shows the connectivity that exists between the Eastern Atlantic and the Western Atlantic. And so um, you can't overlook the small species. They're just as important as the large species because they can tell us a lot about the functionality and the biogeography of particular places. Moving on to the Azores, um, the waters around the Azores contain some of the most important island, open water, and deep sea environments in the Atlantic region. These islands sit on a triple junction of three large tectonic plates, the North American plate, the Eurasian plate, and the African plate. They're also bisected by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is the largest mountain chain on Earth. So a combination of all these unique geological features, all the seamounts in the area, creates a, an amazing diversity of organisms that are unparalleled in the Atlantic and make the Azores a really important place in the region for a numerous number, for a large number of species. These waters are important for a number of open ocean species that migrate, but also some that are residents like this sperm whale here with um, aggregate to give birth around the archipelago during the summer months. Here's a, a mother and calf sperm whale and um, you know, the largest tooth whale that we see in the ocean, highly charismatic species, uh, amazing to see these places, they, these species, they were hunted to near extinction due to whaling you know, a century ago, but have started to rebound as a result of the protection that the species has been afforded. Um, the Azores is also home to at least three species of, of mobula rays. Um, this one species here, the Chilean devil ray. Um, they all aggregate uh, particularly around the seamounts around the Azores, which are highly productive due to a lot of upwelling and a great amount of plankton and productivity, which is associated with the unique geology and ocean currents of the region. Uh, researchers at the University of the Azores have tagged this individual and shown that they dive down to depths of at least 400 meters. So um, a number of important pelagic species, uh, including species like this uh, endangered shark fin mako shark here. They were frequently observed um, on 
a lot of our interactions in the Azure are showing um, how this area is important for this particular species as well. Um, this is one of the fastest swimming sharks in the ocean. And interestingly enough, it has one of the largest brain to body ratios, making it also incredibly clever as sharks go. The Azores is also an important nearshore area for, it's in a nursery habitat for the vulnerable uh, smooth hammerhead shark. We also observed uh, females that were pregnant. Um, and again, so highlighting these important nursery habitats, it's important to protect these, particularly for vulnerable species. Uh, critical life history phases like nursery habitats are important to protect because those are the bottlenecks that pre prevent the species from um, being abundant and from uh, replenishing themselves. We also saw juvenile and sub-adult loggerhead turtles, another threatened species that was common around the Azores. Um, it's an important feeding location. They feed around the seamounts again, which are highly productive areas and are important for loggerhead turtles and the other species I previously mentioned. In the near shore habitats, we find um, these dense forests of cystisaria algae in some parts of the archipelago, but not throughout. Um, there's this species has declined throughout the region and it's an important habitat that creates diversity for a lot of the inshore species. So the absence of them um, leads to a degradation of the nearshore habitat. So it's abundance still in a few places of the Azores is good to note and important to try to protect and identify as key areas for conservation into the future around the Azores. Uh, I mentioned the dusky grouper previously around the salvagens, and it's been heavily fished throughout the Azores. In 1999, a reserve for the dusky grouper was established around Corvo Island in the western portion of the archipelago. And today this reserve hosts likely one of the highest densities of this species in the Azores, and likely aids in the replenishment of this species in the nearby fished areas, showing the benefits of marine protection, not only for protection itself within those areas, but also as a fisheries replenishment tool in the adjacent areas. So Portugal's island archipelago harbor unique biodiversity and are important to the health of the entire region. Greater protection for these areas are imperative if we were to have a thriving ocean into the future. And we can learn from a lot of examples from what we've seen in places like salvagens and some of the remote areas of the Azores that, that are still healthy. Thank you very much and have a great ocean week. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tom Morato from the University of the Azores in Portugal. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Explorers Club and Fundação Ocean Azul for the invitation to be part of this uh, event. Um, today, I'll be talking about exploration of the deep sea uh, in the Azores area. Uh, I'm leading a research group along with Marina Carreiro Silva from our university uh, that aims to uh, improve uh, the understanding of the deep sea, mostly in the Atlantic um, Ocean Basin but also uh, in other basin scales. The main goal of our work is to have a better understanding of the species that live in this region, with emphasis, of course, in the Azores Economic Exclusive Zone, uh, but also how these uh, species distribute um, along the mid ocean ridges and the several seamounts and island slopes that we have in our region. And um, we also want to understand what are the impacts of human activities on these ecosystems, not only impact of fisheries, climate change, but also the future potential impact of um, deep sea mining. Um, the main goal of our work is to then provide um, scientific based uh, information to the government of the Azores, the government of Portugal, to the European Union and to the United Nations in order to promote uh, conservation and the sustainable use of the marine resources. The Azores is, uh, is vast, it's about 1 million square kilometers. And we set the goal that by 
2020, 2021, we would visit every single uh, geomorphological feature down to a thousand meters. Um, this work, which is basically exploring the areas that live um, in the Azores is at down to a thousand meters, has been quite difficult. This is because the Portugal and the Azores region doesn't have a dedicated research vessel uh, that could facilitate a deep sea exploration. Therefore, our group over the last 10 to 20 years um, luckily uh, was able to build partnerships with several institutions. For example, the videos, the photos and videos that we are seeing now is from a collaboration that we have with Fundação Oceano Azul through the Blue Resource Program and the Hydrographic Institute in Lisbon that allowed us to explore a portion of the Mid-Atlantic reach around the gigant seamount. These collaborations um, have allowed us to visit, it, to visit some areas, uh, but although the, the rhythm of our exploration was being slow. Recently, we uh, were um, <coughs> we were award uh, Eurofleet Plus um, grant that allocated us 17 days of the research vessel Pelagia uh, to explore the northern portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge using the video systems that NEOS developed called the OPA camera system that you see on the on the seafloor and with this um, <clears throat> during this cruise we visited and explored areas on the north portion of the mid-atlantic ridge but as i said before um, using these um, expensive tools like rovs tilt cameras require uh, large research vessels and since we don't have those uh, vessels available to us every day we decided to uh, try to develop um, alternative systems that could allow us to do deep sea exploration in the easiest and cheaper way. Therefore, we developed a system that we called uh, the Azores Drift Cam, that basically it's um, effective, that allow us to have a rapid appraisal of the benthic communities that live um, on the deep sea. It's cheap we call it a low cost uh, instrument because it's in the range of 10,000 um, euros. It's simple because it's built with off-the-shelf um, products, uh, is light and easy to, um, to operate. But most of the most importantly uh, the operation is very easy and you can operate from research vessels to fishing boats um, and it allows us for a rapid appraisal of the the deep sea. So we here in Dream we see the areas that we were able to explore using these different methodologies over the last uh, 15 years. And we now have the feeling that uh, we, we start getting a good understanding of what lives uh, in the deep waters of, of the Azores. Um, over the last years we, we were able to visit it uh, and do exploration of many areas and we say exploration because uh, in fact we were the first ones to visit most of the sea mounts and the portion of the ridges that uh, um, exist inside the Azores uh, EZ and we found out that uh, our region is probably a not spot of biodiversity of cold water corals mainly of octo corals and that it also contains some um, endemic, uh, endemic species um, we saw just before uh, some, some images of Efinadabne, which is one of the few endemic species of the Azores. With these uh, explorations, we were able to uh, identify areas that could fit the um, criteria for defining an areas of vulnerable marine um, ecosystem. We um, found, for example, some areas that we saw before uh, with large gardens of Paragorgia jonesoni, which is a, um, an octocoral uh, that forms um, a large uh, three-dimensional structures and therefore it creates habitats for um, other uh, species that live associated with it. Not only fish but many invertebrates that live associated to this habitat structuring um, species. Most recently, we also found um, large aggregations of black corals, not these ones, but black corals, um, 
that we found on the recent cruise in the northern portion of the, of the Atlantic Ridge. And um, in the beginning, we thought that most black holes have already been impacted by um, deep sea fission because they overlap in, in the distribution. And with great surprise and satisfaction, we found uh, in this uh, area, in the north part of the, of the, of the Mar, uh, extensive aggregations of black corals. And these species grow so slow that can be for 3,000 years or more. Um, and we can see some, some images of this just, just um, as, as we speak. We also found these nice uh, uh, remains of what were in the past um, coral reefs. And we found also in this north portion of the reef some uh, areas that still contain uh, aggregations of Lophelia and, uh, and Madrepra. Um, we also <coughs> identified large areas that uh, contain, um, and these are, sorry to go back, these are the aggregations of black corals that, that we saw. We haven't yet uh, quantified the densities or the sizes that this, uh, of the species that we observed, but we are certain that this is probably one of the largest aggregations of black corals that exists in the Azores and probably in the old Atlantic Ocean. And um, these species, the cold water corals in general, that not, they not only provide habitat for other species that uh, I already mentioned, but they are, the, they are also important um, in, in the climate free regulation because they um, do carbon sequestration and with that the uh, cold water corals they um, allow um, to take um, carbon from, from the water column and therefore um, to um, regulate the, the climate. Um, during these years, we were able to collect some samples that help us to, to identify uh, the species that live in our area. However, every time we go out to the sea to do exploration and monitoring, we find new species, we find new things, we find, we find new habitats. And um, this makes our, um, our daily lives extremely um, happy because we, are, we never know when we go out there what we will see or what we will find. Here we can see some nice images that we recorded of, uh, in this case, um, scabbard fish, the silver scabbard fish, and also some kite fin sharks. Kite fin sharks have been protected in the Azores um, for, for some time, in Europe for some time. We also find in some areas large aggregations of, um, of orange ruffy and cardinal fish, for example. And this is quite interesting because the Azores um, um, approved a, a ban on, on lock and trolling, and uh, this had a, a significant impact in the conservation of these species and also on the habitats that they uh, live associated with, with, for example, uh, cold water corals and, and sponges um, aggregations. In 2018, with uh, the help of the from the Sound Blue Azores and with um, the Hydrographic Institute uh, collaboration, we found this unexpected hydrothermal event. We named it the Luzo hydrothermal event because, to our knowledge, was the first the first hydrothermal event that was discovered by a Portuguese scientific team on board of a Portuguese vessel with a Portuguese ROV that was being piloted by a Portuguese team of ROV pilots. Um, these events, they don't produce black smokers, so they are really difficult to uh, identify uh, where they are located. So these events are very rich in hydrogen and iron, and they may, they may be um, fueling uh, the seamount where they exist with iron that can be brought to the surface due to a boiling event and uh, used by a phytoplankton and to create uh, areas of higher productivity. Uh, this seamount, for example, Gigant, is known to be a highly productive seamount where not only primary productivity is enhanced, but where uh, small pelagic fish and large uh, pelagic animals, not only tuna, but also marine mammals and, and other uh, large pelagic visitors, uh, visit this seamount for probably feeding, but also for uh, orientation. So we think that this uh, type of hydrothermal events may have, uh, may play an important role in the ecosystem and they may 
probably uh, act as uh, fooling um, these amounts with uh, iron that may enhance the productivity associated to, to these uh, vein systems. We don't know how many of them are there uh, in the global ocean or in the Azores or even in the Middle Atlantic Ridge, but we think that there are many more than what we have discovered uh, so far. So, all this um, data uh, that we collected, um, it, it is not only useful for exploration per se, to know what species live in our waters, where they are distributed, and what are the drivers of the distribution, but uh, this information is extremely useful to inform the society, the governments, and the general uh, and NGOs, for example, um, with the natural capital that exists in our region. And with this, we want to inform things like, for example, marine spatial planning processes, the designation of new marine protected areas, but at the end of the day, to inform the sustainable use and the conservation of the marine resources and the oceans for current generations, but also for the generations to come. So, to make this uh, happen, we would like to have better long-term strategies for exploring the deep sea around the Azores. We would like to see our country with better and more modern research vessels to put this mission and vision in practice. And we also would like to finish that young scientists and all the scientists like myself would have the opportunity to have a, a solid and a long lasting and stable scientific career. So with this, I would like to thank again for the invitation to be part of this uh, nice event. Again, the, the Explorers Club and the Fundação Ocean Azul for the invitation. Thank you very much and I wish you a lovely week. Hello to all. It's an honor to be here today and to share this seafloor with such an amazing panel. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Anna. I work as a project manager here at the Oceano Azul Foundation, mostly dedicated to the blue natural capital and most specifically to the, to the new blue bioeconomy. I'll start the, this short presentation to actually present you the vision uh, of, of, that defines us as an organization. Oceano Azul Foundation was created four years ago with a vision that a healthy ocean is essential for human development. We thus focus most of our work in marine conservation, but we understand that to do it in an effective way, in a sustainable way, we do need to change our economy and thus we need to change our economy model, mostly focused nowadays on an extractive model rather than a regenerative model. And so we live up to our challenge and the challenge that is not also blue, but is also green and many other colors, which is to decouple the economic growth from the natural resource depletion. In line with this goal, we'll need of course to assure simultaneously that nature conservation and that valuing biodiversity is in itself the basis for the new economy. The world is aware of this today and has been rising up to this challenge like few times before. We see that the knowledge uh, currently produced by scientific research is the basis for most policy development and actually also for stressing world's targets uh, in, in, from our governments, from the national to international agreements, such as the Paris Agreement. We do see that the, that the world is rising up to the level of this challenge and so recognizing that it exists. They also recognize the importance of financing and investing in nature conservation as a way to sustain the future of our societies and a way to sustain life on Earth. The, la the latest months, we have also seen an urge in many of those reports focused on several of these of this issues, but we also see many initiatives arising from the public, uh, from the public sector, such as government. And so we've seen the program is increasing. And we also see that as it increases, we see more of those solutions coming out and more of, of course, also the potential that we were tackling in 2018 when we saw that the blue bioeconomy could have a role in nature conservation and in blue natural capital valuation. And we see actually these startups speaking for themselves in terms of the potential that the area has. And we see 
startups working in the areas of the human wealth, uh, human human wealth and and well uh, human well being and and human health. And we see, for instance, many working in a pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, or offering cosmetic solution. We see it coming from the food and fix feed sector uh, with a lot of uh, uh, projects coming from, 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 from across the globe on these areas. We see, of course, in the industrial solutions as well, with new uh, dyes being produced, with biopolymers being studied, with new biomaterials such as tax textiles being produced without recurring to fresh water. And so we also see in the last stage uh, bioremediation projects and projects dedicated to restoration, such as reef restoration. And knowing all of these results, of course, we would relaunch this year physically again the Blue Bio Valence. So we are running now for the fourth edition of the Accelerator, which will take place in the fall. And so applications are open now until uh, 26th of July. And so are for the ideation, which is our new program. We tested in pilots last year uh, because we understood that we needed something to go a little, back, a little bit back on the process of creating value. And there is a current problem, which is we don't know how to transfer knowledge from the research and development centers to rising to our shelves one day. And we see that that path needs to be ignited and needs to be accelerated. And so that's why we created the ideation, focusing on this later and that initial stage ideas that really need a little bit more of attention and efforts also to be empowered and for when they join the accelerator and later on to join the world. So I look forward, if you have any questions, to, to answering them. Uh, you can contact us through Blue Bio Value and, and, of course, visit our website as well. The answers are out there, and we hope that tools such as this demonstrate that. São algumas das ilhas mais bonitas da Terra. Únicas. Isoladas. Os Açores, uma força que atrai vida. Mas este paraíso está ameaçado. Nós podemos perder estes valores naturais se não conseguirmos agir rapidamente. Assim, uma equipa de cientistas junta esforços, 28 investigadores de nove países, numa expedição sem precedentes. para explorar e documentar as riquezas marinhas dos Açores. The Azores are most definitely at a defined tipping point. Aquilo que nós observamos são impactos a uma escala de praticamente todos os locais onde nós mergulhamos. Vamos tentar perceber um pouco mais sobre os grandes predadores pelágicos. These remote camera systems give us a complete picture of the life in the waters without the presence of humans in them. Uh, vamos e tentar, digamos, dedicar-nos só ao oceano aberto e também à sua ligação com o oceano profundo. Um dos objetivos da expedição é fazer uma avaliação mais completa possível da biodiversidade de, destas zonas, para depois poder recomendar medidas de proteção e medidas de gestão sustentável. É um fantástico. Nunca imaginaríamos que, que fôssemos encontrar nenhum campo hidrotermal. E é como andar pelo mundo nos Himalaias e alguém dizendo que há um novo Mount Everest. Você pode acreditar? É simplesmente incrível. A conservação dos usos humanos tem que andar de mãos dadas. Nós temos conseguido alterar o paradigma onde, para ter o desenvolvimento económico, temos que ter degradação ambiental. E foi isso que nós temos feito no oceano. Ora, nós não acreditamos que isso seja possível, não acreditamos que isso seja o futuro. E de se perdermos o que aqui temos hoje, não vamos voltar a recuperar. E, portanto, há uma urgência de atuar. O momento de atuar é agora.
I got really excited to create a pattern for the Konken, since growing up me and so many of my friends had one. My name is Lynn Fritz, and I work as an illustrator and animator. I mainly work digitally with a wide range of editorial and commercial projects, creating characters and clean lines. So with this project, I decided to experiment a bit outside my everyday comfort zone. Growing up, my dad would never stop reminding me of the importance of being outside and taking care of nature. So for this Konkin art project, I want to bring awareness to one of the biggest concerns facing our oceans and our planet today. My Konkin became an abstract pattern inspired by pieces of plastic. Oceans have carried us to great explorations around the globe and in their depths. Only recently have we come to truly appreciate their essential role in our lives. We hope this fifth celebration of Oceans Week has contributed not only to a better understanding of the ocean, but also as a guide to actions that will help preserve a natural and essential ecosystem. And like so much of life, what we do now can in its own small way contribute to the hope that our precious world of water will improve for future generations, generations to come. For those who contributed your expertise and time, we would like to acknowledge our gratitude for helping to create a week that inspired and energized our viewers on so many different areas of ocean stewardship. Thank you to Rolex for being our founding and continual partner over the years. And thank you to my partner, Ted, for five years of collaboration to bring these Ocean Week messages to the membership and beyond. Ted. Thanks, Anne. And I'd, uh, I'd like to start by thanking Anne, who 
seemingly works 25 seven and does so much to pull all of this week into uh, reality from all the ideas that everybody um, puts out. So um, just our, all of our sincerest thanks to, to Anne. Um, the staff, uh, needless to say, as we're used to by this point, was just remarkable. Luis and Alex on audiovisual, uh, continuously um, doing amazing things and putting in such hard work. Uh, Max has been with us uh, you know, since the beginning. Kevin, Brittany, Andrew all put in tremendous amounts of time, virtually all the staff at some point in time. And that includes the current administration and Will and Richard and all the folks who have been supportive of this. Um, it's just so, so important to us. Um, then also the UN who's been a terrific partner um, since inception and really helped um, with a great back and forth spirit of building this program out. Francois and Valentino, we heard from their uh, folks earlier this week, Pew Charitable Trusts, first time I was partnering with them on the, the plastics uh, panel. Um, Sylvia Earle, of course, um, always fantastic to have her an incredible and inspiring voice moving us all. And along with that, Emmanuel Goncalves and Oceano Azul, who are fantastic partners um, for some time now. Um, I'd like to also say with respect to the, the members, um, before we turn it over to some of the folks to hear independently, um, a special uh, shout out to just a few more. Um, Kahoot um, Entrepreneurship One and Sonova did an amazing job of pulling a whole new um, distribution and communication lens um, into our, our site, which we really appreciate. That was energizing and fun. And Phil Raven, who continues to be a dedicated sponsor of the club and support us in all the most meaningful ways. Um, and again, before I turn it back to a few of our other team members, a special, special thank you to Rolex, who has been there from the very beginning, took a chance on us our very first year, has stuck with us all the way through, um, and is just about the, the best partner one could um, imagine in these circumstances. So a, a special thank you to, to Rolex. And now for the members, um, you've, been, you've been seeing the scrolls uh, each night of uh, who's been engaged. It's a long list, which is fantastic and speaks to the interests and passion of the membership of the Explorers Club. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, pass it around to a few of the folks who are here with us. And after that, we're going to scroll through the names um, one more time so you, we can acknowledge the people who have put um, so much work into this uh, week. And we're, we're, so, um, we're so proud and grateful of, of all the efforts of, of the people who, who um, were a part of this. So thank you to everyone. And thank you, of course, to all the people who are on the panels and all the people who are the moderators. Um, and all the folks who came up and showed up to engage with great questions and attendance throughout the week. Hi, I'm Julie Wallace, a member of the Florida chapter. I worked on the Sustainable Seafood Program, the Fjall Raven Sponsorship for World Oceans Week, and the World Oceans Week Donations Drive. And remember, you still have an opportunity to donate at the Explorers Club store website. The message I would like to share is that we are all stewards of this earth and the oceans connect us all. Many ideas have potential to help the oceans thrive. Our ideas need commitment and a collective effort. Hello, I'm Alex Moore. I'm, uh, this is my third ocean week and I'm closing it from uh, uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, the greatest commonwealth in this country. Uh, which is a national seashore, one of the most beautiful national parks uh, in the U.S. Uh, the ocean has been at the center of my life since I was a little kid in the uh, Mediterranean, and uh, it brought me here, and it's an honor to be involved in this fifth Ocean Week and to close it so great, so well with uh, everyone. Uh, so enjoy this weekend, and uh, I'll see you next year at World Oceans Week 2022. Hi, I'm Alex Wallace. I'm a member of the Florida chapter in Winter Park, Florida. And I wanted to say what a pleasure it's been on this fifth Oceans Week uh, to work with this very dedicated group of members, uh, incredibly talented staff, uh, and with the leadership of Ann Passer and Ted Janoulis and what they have brought to this. Uh, once again, there's been a uh, great collection of collaborators, panelists, presenters, and it has all come together to point to us 
the importance of the oceans, the importance of healthy oceans and what it means in all of our lives. And I simply uh, feel grateful to be able to participate in this. And uh, maybe after a day or two uh, break, uh, I look forward to uh, getting ready for next year's sixth uh, edition. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Colin Bettis. I'm a member of the DC chapter of the Explorers Club and helped put together the state-of-the-art ships panel. And uh, the little bit that I want to share aside from just thanking the, uh, the collective of the team here, um, coming from a wide range of outstanding backgrounds, all passionate and dedicated about this, uh, uh, this uh, worthy cause. Um, from, from my background as a, a, a technologist in, in uh, exploration, um, I noticed as the development of technology across the world moves from the computer age to the information age, through the, through the bio, biotechnology age, we see the ocean as key to unlocking a sustainable future for the entirety of our global community. So I was very thrilled to be a part of such a dynamic team here at the Explorers Club and dedicate to this worthy cause. I look forward to all of our uh, oceans events in the future. So happy World Oceans Week, everybody. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy McCain and I'm a uh, fellow uh, a member here at the Explorers Club. I'm very excited to be part of uh, all the work that's uh, of these amazing human beings that are also possible for making World Oceans Week, uh, you know, what it is. Uh, I was on the uh, Toxic Oceans uh, panel with, uh, with, with uh, Terrence Patrick Long uh, and Matt Carter and also uh, Jim Porter. It was really important, obviously, because when we look at our oceans, it is our life support system here on Spaceship Earth, as I like to tell everybody. And all we are is just crew members. Every second breath we know comes from the ocean. We hear that all the time. But talking is one thing. Acting is another. And one of the reasons why I absolutely love everyone that is part of the Explorers Club is that we are all actionists in our own way. And every single year, it's amazing to see what folks are working on the things that they're trying to accomplish and how people just join together to make the impossible possible. At the end of the day, all of our mission as we walk away from this amazing week that we've had, we must remember that in order to make the most amount of action possible, we need to make the unseen seen. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm Jeremy McCain. Uh, hello, I'm Martha Shaw. I'm a fellow of the Explorers Club, a marine geologist, and I want to say thank you to the entire ecosystem of organizers, speakers, sponsors, and to the many people on the back end from uh, planning to orchestrating this beautiful and complex event. You know, we are an ecosystem ourselves, as beautiful and diverse as the ocean itself. And last of all, I've got to thank the ocean for being there. Uh, this miraculous, wonderful, wonderful, diverse, mysterious place that we have so much fun exploring. Thank you for being with us. Thanks everybody. And don't forget, tomorrow is the beach sweep at Coney Island with Mara Hoseltine. And um, everybody get out there in the morning and do your job. So it was wonderful to have all of you. Thank you for everything and happy Ocean Sweep. What does the ocean mean to me? Well, I can see dolphins and go swimming, so I really like it. Far 
worries have died Salt water wells in my eyes I have lived for love But now that's not enough For the world I love is dying And now I'm crying And time is not a friend Friends, we're out of time And it's slowly passing by Right before our eyes We like the deepest ocean Send photographs of Mars We're so enchanted by how clever we are Why should one Baby feels so hungry she cries Salt water wells in my Salt water wells in my eyes Salt water wells in my eyes